Lots of people like her out there now saying that because there have been legitimate areas of concern around the COVID vaccines, um, that everything about them is flawed and wrong. And therefore, all the scientists who promoted them uh, are the devil. And this stuff gathers momentum. I see it spreading like wildfire. You know, she also says that Emmanuel Macron's wife is a man despite having had three kids and so on. And these things gather their own momentum. And whilst on one level it's sort of humorous, on another level it's actually, I think, very damaging because it means that scientists can never be wrong again. Because if they're wrong about any one aspect of a big thing like a COVID pandemic, which is fast moving and evolving and changing, if they're wrong about any aspect of it, the whole thing gets trashed by this community. Here's this this is why we have to understand that this is about the age of conspiracy the very thing that eric i well, think I agree, is trying I agree to with combat you about that, yeah is to say science is about figuring out where we are wrong and if mm. scientists stake their reputation as they have done over the last four or five years entirely on always being right then if i can pull one thread and it falls apart everything is dead but yeah. if science just gets behind Feynman's statement that this is about distrusting experts and figuring out where they're wrong now it can become a far more fruitful pursuit of what actually works. Okay, Brian, Brian, your thoughts on that? Yeah, Tom, just because someone's an expert doesn't necessarily mean that you have to distrust them. When you look at something, there's a concept called Brandolini's Law which my kids are nearby, so I'm not gonna say it in, full, in its full terms, but it's basically that it's 10 times easier to produce something that's BS and so than it is to refute it. Therefore, the world is full of unrefuted BS. Yeah. And to put that on scientists, to make us sort of the uh, uh, you know intellectual SEAL Team 6, where we can never be wrong. The terrorists only have to be right once. Mm. And everyone else is, is relying on us, SEAL Team 6, that we're never wrong. To put that on uh, in perspective, you know, when you listen to people like this, Candace tweeting from her laptop and, and enabled by technology that was invented at Bell Labs, that was uh, the byproduct of the space race, which she also denies, moon landings and, and so forth. Yeah. We're not in new age. We're, we're, in an, we're in a pre-scientific age where people can, unfortunately, spread not scientific truth, via scientific proof, which Eric, I'm sorry to say, I, my academic genealogy goes back 17 generations. Every single one of those people, including my students, I'm now in my third generation. I have graduate students that have their own graduate students. They've all been through peer review. We didn't have Pergamon Press and Robert Maxwell. That, that is true. Einstein published all, almost all of his famous papers. They were done by peer review. In fact, the discovery of gravitational waves, one of the most revolutionary discoveries in all of science, that prediction, he first tried to get submitted in the early 1930s, and he didn't want to get it peer reviewed, and there was an error in it. He said it would never be detected. Imagine that. Einstein made a mistake. But thanks to peer review, that paper was published in 1936, and it went on to win the Nobel Prize for some of my good friends. I've interviewed 20 Nobel laureates on my uh, podcast, and three of them won the Nobel prize for the discovery of the thing that Einstein thought was impossible. We can go back many, many generations. And yes, they didn't have presses. Of course, the printing press was only a relatively recent invention. But you go to the peer uh, to the peer review process, not far from where peers is right now is the Royal Society, and also not too far away is the Royal Institution. I've been to both places. I've lectured there. And when you go to those places, yes, there wasn't a press, but you gather your peers around you and you do an experiment. And that experiment would either fail or pass in real time, and you would get feedback from a jury, a okay. real jury of peers. Okay, uh, uh, Eric, it's wait, interesting wait, watching wait, Elon wait. Musk. I was with him actually the other day. Down wait, in wait, 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 oh. wait, wait, wait. I have to respond to that. Okay, respond Brian, first. What you just said is not true. You know, it's just it, it, the fact is is the that Einstein, Einstein paper was not for the most in part. After peer review error. Sorry, that was John Tate, who was the editor at Physical Review before Simon Pasternak, before S uh, Sam uh, Goodschmidt. Uh, yes, it is true that most of Einstein's work was not peer-reviewed. That's why he was incensed. He never sent another paper to Physical Review, if I'm not incorrect. Please check me on it. Um, was that paper The fact is... There was one paper with Rosen that was peer-reviewed, which incensed Einstein because he was used to not being peer-reviewed. And he was in wrong other words, about it. 
until peer review you're, pointed you're not, out by Edding, Eddington helped out as well and said that you're, you're not, there was an not, error in you're his not calculation. Hearing me. Peer review is not referee review, right? We had external referees that were occasionally sought, uh, but the what you cite about the Royal Society is in fact an error introduced into the literature by Merton, the famous historian of science, uh, who is the father of the Merton of Black Shoals Merton fame, um, and that was an erroneous uh, claim that peer review began, I think, in the 1700s. What we currently call peer review is far more recent, and it is fantastic to find out that our professor does not know the history of peer review in its own subjects. Um, because what we have is we have a chorus of people with the highest credentials repeating a fable. And we can't always tell when we've been, um, when malware has entered our minds. But I would submit to you, sir, that despite your pedigree, uh, in general, your predecessors were not peer reviewed uh, in any modern sense of the term before the 1970s uh, certainly before the 1960s, uh, the, the, the beginning of forms for external referees uh, begins, I think, in the 1930s under John Tate. I just don't think you know the history. I okay. do know it. And in fact, I can invite you to go down to the Royal Institution next time you're in London, and you'll see pictures of Michael Faraday, of J.J. Thompson, of, the, of Eddington. You'll see them in front of audiences. Was there a peer review process before journals? When would oh, the that's, journal nature that's, start? The average this, person this is punching perfect. themselves what in the face right now. As somebody that loves you two, literally, I know both these guys. Eric, I know very well. Uh, both have been on my show. Brian, I love you guys. So I say this because I am begging you. The average person wants to chew through their TV set right now or their laptop as they're listening to this. And the reason is they don't care about this. You, it, It's no, already do done. The Tom, world is, sorry, sorry. No, hold on, hold on. Tom. Let me finish, let me finish. The world cares about people like they want to hear what Joe Rogan has to say. They want to hear who, who goes on his show. They, they are absolutely going to listen to Candace. I think, Brian, you brought that up. Candace is about to sweep the world. And if I could just get you guys on board with the reality that we are in a very difficult moment right now where, yes, you guys are being asked to do a public service, which is to collide with these people who do not have your scientific bona fides, but the average person does not care, but they will actually listen to your collision of ideas for sure, because I took a lot away from you talking to Terrence. And the first time I heard Terrence, I was like, maybe this is genius, I don't know.